we can continue in those ways. He won't stop us because he's a gentleman. He's a gentleman. He's not going to force us to do anything. What he wants is for us to turn our hearts to him on our own. He wants us to give us us to give him our heart because we love him because we trust him because we believe in him because we know that he is the one who created us in the beginning that's why he wants us to turn to him not because he's forced us to David sent men to ask Nabal now this is David and Nabal okay Cam go ahead David sent men to ask Nabal for supplies Okay, now you know David was King David, right? He was the one who was ruling over all Israel, who was turned away empty-handed and he spoke harshly to. Now, now David was in himself. He, he had a lot of things. He had all the animals and he had... God had given him plenty. He had blessed him. So David decided, because he was in his drunken state, that King David was going to get a joke on him. And he was going to have the, the say of the day. Well, he had the say of the day. <clears throat> David sent men to ask Nabal for supplies, who was turned away empty-handed and spoken harshly to. Abigail, who was Nabal's wife, had wisdom and brought supplies to David and his men because she understood what this meant. Look at what happened. 1 Samuel 25, 36 through 38. Now Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was, holding a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk, reveling. Therefore, she told him nothing. She said, no, no, this is not the time to speak to this man because he's, he's not even in him. He's not in his own mind. He's not in himself. She said nothing, little or much, until morning light. So it was in the morning when the wine had gone from Nabal and his wife, had told him the things that he did to King David in turning him away, oh, that his heart died within him and he became like a stone. Why do you think his heart died within him? See, Nabal understood that whenever he turned on King David, it was the end of his life. He was done for. Not because King David was going to do it. Now, King David did want to do it at first, but Abigail came and talked to him and said, no, no, let the Lord. See, this is where we have to understand we have to let the Lord be our God, not the ways of the world. He said, no. She said, no, let the Lord take care of this for you, King David, but I have brought to you what you've asked for. He said, wise woman, you are, because you've done this. I will not kill him. But ten days later, Nabal died, not because of King David, because the Lord struck him. Why? Because he went against what the Lord wanted him to do. You might be saying, yeah, but that was in the Old Testament. So let's look at what is in the New Testament about reveling. Okay, I'm fixing to take you again through some of scriptures. Not my words, God's words. Not about me, but about the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? All right, I want to repeat that one sentence one more time. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers. Uh -uh, I'm going to stop right there. This is about Mardi Gras. Nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, you're hell bound. If you continue partying, in Mardi Gras, people think, well, oh, you're being... No, I'm not judging. I'm judging the fruit of what you're doing. And when you're doing these things, God says this, not Rachel. I don't say it. God says, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Think about it. Now, I would say to anyone who is 
allowing themselves to be controlled in the revelry, the dancing, the lewdness, the drunkenness in any part or any form of Mardi Gras, that you are now in danger of not being in the kingdom of God unless you learn to come to, the, to God and change your ways and change your heart. And such were some of you, but you were washed. Here we go. This is what I'm talking about right here. When we change our ways, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. When we turn from those things and we come to God, then we are no longer being deceived by the devil. We're no longer doing the things of the world, but we are now doing what Christ has called us to do. Paul warned them to not be deceived. Those who are criticized by the sins identified by in this passage bear evidence that they are not true believers as their actions reveal that they have not experienced the regenerating work of the Spirit. By contrast, true believers have not have been washed, sanctified, and justified. I'm going to share this with you real quick because same thing I should, me and Susan was talking about this morning. You see, I was never into alcohol, but I smoked cigarettes. I had nicotine addiction. Do you hear me? And that's no different than anything else. An addiction is an addiction. I was addicted to cigarettes, and I smoked for, oh, I don't care, so I was 16, 14 when I started and quit at 38. There you go. But to understand this, when, when you're in an addiction, I'm going to talk about, let's say, from alcohol, drugs, whatever is, whatever is holding you into staying in this side of the world, in this part of the party and in the reveling, whatever addiction is holding you, then what you need to do is seek the Lord your God with all your heart so that he can help you change. You see, when I came to know Christ, and I started reading his word, and it started changing my heart. So when my heart started changing, and I'm sitting here smoking a cigarette, and he's just told me that your body is the temple of the Holy, of, of, of the Lord's temple, the house, and the Holy Spirit resides within it. So when I started understanding that this is the temple, so I have to keep it clean. I have to do my best to do what's right by it, right? So smoking... I started feeling like this ain't right. See, this was in the beginning when I first gave my heart to Christ. This isn't right, and I don't want to do it anymore. But let me just share this with you. Because previously in my life, I had tried so many times to give cigarettes up, and I couldn't. I couldn't quit smoking, not on my own. I could not do it on my own. I tried several times. I would lie, y'all, go into my bathroom and smoke and come out like I never smoked a cigarette, acting like nobody knew I was still smoking. Really? You know, that's how bad it was. That's how hard it was because I was addicted to the cigarette, to the, to the nicotine. But God. So when God came and he changed my heart, that's when I was able to go and ask the Holy Spirit to help me. I was able to ask him to help me not want that cigarette anymore, to help me not ever want to smoke again. Be careful what you pray for because you'll get it. Because I, I didn't only ask him to help me to not ever want a cigarette again. I said, if I smell cigarette smoke, let me not be able to breathe. If I'm around it and it makes me so sick I want to throw up and can't stop until I'm away from it. Well, let me just tell you something. Be careful. Because now if I'm around cigarette smoke too long, I get to where I can't breathe. Pastor Joe was going to take me out to eat one night. They were given a, um, a meal over at the Hard Rock, I think it was, my babe, cafe or whatever it is. So we walked, and of course you have to walk through the casino itself to get to the restaurant. And we're walking through, and the smoke was pretty thick. Well, by the time we got up to the line where you had to stand and wait in line for the, to eat, I was turning green. I couldn't breathe. I felt sick. I said, I don't think I can eat anything right here. I said, I don't think I can eat. I was just feeling really bad. I, I was kind of wondering what's wrong with me. 
So I said, I think I just need to go. I'm sorry. I hate it, but I, I can't eat. So we got up, turned around, walked out, got out. After a few minutes walking in the fresh air, going to the car, I said, ooh, I feel better. I feel fine. It's because I was getting what I prayed for. I said, Lord, if I'm in cigarette smoke too long, let me not be able to breathe. If I'm in cigarette smoke too long, let it make me sick and nauseous to the point I can't. I'm ready to throw up. And guess what? I got what I prayed for. Be careful what you pray. But I also got the relief from the addiction. He relieved me from that addiction. I've never smoked a cigarette or wanted one since. But it's because I sat on my mother's back porch and I asked him, Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to take the want out of my body for this cigarette. This is the last one I ever want to smoke again in my life. When I put it out, let this be the last one I ever want in Jesus' name. And I put it out, and that was the end. Now, am I saying he's going to do that for you in every single situation? No, because he doesn't. That was, my, that was my testimony from the Lord because he wanted to show me that he is who he said he is because I was a new baby in Christ at that point. So what we have to understand is sometimes we have to go through things to get to where God wants us to be. He wants us to understand and see that while you may be in your addiction, I'm going to help you come out of it, but you have to also put your will into it. You have to have a heart that really wants it. Hallelujah. Praise God. <clears throat> so can we have enjoyment? We there? The word enjoy means to make delight, satisfaction, or pleasure in an activity or occasion or to possess and benefit from. 1 Timothy 6.17 Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty or haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Okay, let's do that one more time. I just want to make sure that in 1 Timothy 6 through 17, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in certain uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly in all things to enjoy. Go back, Cameron. Look at this. So you can get up in the morning. This is, and by the way, this is a secular song, but if you listen to it, it has so much meaning. Because we're going to get up in the morning, and we're going to enjoy the day. I'm going to enjoy the day because of who, turn it down, because of who the Lord is. Not because I'm going to get up and put on my party suit, my party clothes, and I'm going to go out to a float, and I'm going to endow, and, and douse myself in alcohol and smoking weed and whatever else is happening in the day, all day on the float, to the point of, here I am, I'm, I'm saturated in alcohol, uh, then I'm going to go get in my vehicle, and I'm going to try to drive if I make it home, praise God, but I may not, and I may take somebody else's life out while I'm doing that, but I want to enjoy the Lord, so look at the sunshine, get up in the morning, you see, I get up early every morning, no later, I try not to get up, no later than 7.30. I get my cup of coffee, and if the weather permits, I go sit outside for a few minutes. Let the day start with the sunshine. I enjoy my morning with the Lord. See, that's where we're supposed to be. If you have only five minutes with him in the morning, because you're trying to get dressed to go to work, or you're doing, getting up with the kids, whatever you're doing, but that five minutes should be to say, good morning, Lord. Good morning, Jesus. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Thank you for another day, and I thank you that you go before me. If you are for me, Lord, who can be against me? I thank you that you protect my family, that you protect everything that you've given us. But Lord God, above all things, I thank you for my salvation, my healing, and my deliverance. Thank you that you've healed my body, you've healed my mind, you've healed my spirit in Jesus' name. If that's all I do in the morning for that five minutes, that's less than five minutes, I have connected with the Lord, right? 
And then the rest of my day, I get in my word as much as I can. If it's nothing but to turn my word on on the phone, if it's to get my Bible out and sit down and have a Bible study with him, it depends on where you're at in your life and what you can do and can't do. But I'm sure that every day, at some point, you can turn that phone on and get the word in because that's one of, one of the easiest ways to do it. Just get up and enjoy the Lord. That's the first part of the day. If you're in a struggle, what is your struggle? See, here, here again, if I get up in the morning, you know, Pastor Joe and I, we've been, we, we've been going through some stuff recently. Um, you know, there's a, there's a little cloud that's been hanging. But you know what? When you get up and you do what he does and you get up and you do what I do and you greet the Lord and you ask him for help, Lord, I need your peace in this time. Because I know your word says that you're going to take care of us. No matter what happens, your word says we are connected to you. We are faithful. We do what we said you tell us to do. We're going to trust in you, Lord. And see, when I start talking to him like that, that, you know, that peace that he says, I'll give you that peace that surpasses all understanding, all understanding. In other words, I, there's things happening, but my peace in my heart and my peace in my mind is all still there. And if you don't have that peace, then I suggest you find, find the Lord. Seek the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him. Let him direct the path. Because if he's not directing it, there is no peace. I promise you. You might think you have peace for just a little while and he'll... Oh, the devil will let you laugh and party and have a good time. He will let you drink yourself into oblivion. He'll let you do all those things. Because you know what? You're doing just what he wants you to do. You're taking your Holy Spirit out and away from God because he says this is the temple of the Lord and you're separating yourself during that sin time. You're separating yourself from God. Why? Because sin and the Holy Spirit and God do not go together. He does not stay where sin is. He is not involved in sin. He will never be involved in sin. But I know who is. The devil himself. He is very much involved in sin. And his angels, oh, guess what? You know, I get a vision. I, I, every now and then I get visions from the Lord. I get a vision. I see people, when I see people doing especially Mardi Gras and things of that nature, I mean, it, it's not just Mardi Gras. You can go out and in public, you can see people doing things that are against what the Word of God is. When I see that, what I do see, <laughs> I can see Satan sitting over here with the angels that fell out of heaven with him, that followed him. I see him sitting over there going, good job, keep up the good work, because they're terrified of him, because they know he has the way of hurting them. Well, they're doomed anyway, but they don't under understand that undoubtedly. But I can see him patting his angels on the back. Yeah, good job. Keep it up. You've almost took him or her out. Keep it up. A little bit more. Push that, push that fire. Push the fire. Just a little bit harder. Push it. Push it. And the next thing you know, that person may be dead. That person may be so far gone in their mind and in their spirit, they look dead. Even if they're walking, they're looking dead. And that's because that's what the devil does. But God comes and he gives us life. He gives it to us abundantly, assuredly. There is nothing that he will not do, that he will not do for us. But it depends on where we're at in our walk with him as well. He's going to do what he said he'd do, but our walk with him is what's going to count. <clears throat> so I'm going to go back again. As a Christian, it is imperative that we approach any topic. We always seek guidance from Scripture as the ultimate authority on any subject matter, no matter how small, no matter how big. That being said, let's start with looking at the concept of enjoying life from a biblical viewpoint. The Bible's condemnation of reveling does not imply that all kinds of enjoyment, laughter, and fun are sinful. God created us with a sense of humor and wants us to enjoy the life he has given us. James 
every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. But enjoyment must never cross the line into debauchery. We are to be self-controlled even while having fun. Here's where Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. King David, well, let me finish this, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, King David, go read the word. King David enjoyed the Lord so much, and they danced before the Lord. So He danced so hard and, and worshiped the Lord so hard, he danced himself right out of his clothes. Well, I'm not telling us to go dance ourselves out of our clothes. I don't think that would be kind of appropriate, I'll, you know. <laughs> and nobody wants to see me dancing out of the clothes. So let me just say, let's not dance out of our clothes. But King David loved the Lord so much that he went before him and he just literally danced until he came out of his clothes. So he enjoyed the Lord. Now, Ecclesiastes 8.15, So I commended enjoyment because a man has nothing better under the sun than to what? Eat, drink, and be merry. For this will remain with him in his labor all the days of his life, which God gives him under the sun. Now, I quickly discovered that Christians knew how to have fun as the teacher advised us to strive for a joyful life. To put it another way, make the most of it, don't let it slip by you without enjoying it and living it in full. He wasn't encouraging the attitude of eating, drinking, and being happy since tomorrow may die. He was urging us to enjoy life to the utmost and to be grateful for the life the good Lord has given us. As he said, appreciate what God has given us. That, they, they will, that way they will experience happiness along with all the hard work God gives them under the sun. So let's talk about this a minute. He says, eat, drink, and be merry. Now, when he says that, we can eat. God, Lord, the Lord Jesus sat down at a meal with his 12 disciples, and they drank. And I'm sure at that point, more, more than one time he sat with them, they drank their glass of wine. They ate, and I'm sure they joked and talked. Jesus, I'm sure, was a fun person to be around, right? I, if, if we are made in his image, I enjoy laughing. I enjoy joking, not coarse joking, but just to have fun. I bet Jesus did too. So why can't we as Christians do the same thing? Now, if, here's where the struggle comes in. Anyone who cannot handle their alcohol or do things in the right way, then I suggest that if you're going to sit down to eat and drink, you drink something outside of alcohol or liquor of any kind. But those who can, a half a glass of wine, we're not opposed to it, never have been, because I do believe that I'm in control, and I'm going to get there now by the Spirit of the Lord. If we're in control of ourselves, because the Lord is in control, then we can do these things and be okay. If I'm going to sit down and eat, as long as I'm eating and enjoying it, we do this at CR. We come in, we sit down, we eat, we talk, right? We laugh, we enjoy. That is what we do. So there's times we can sit and enjoy life. We don't have to just be all mm -mm, bent over and, oh, my, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, I can't do this, I can't do that, I'm a Christian, I can't do that. That's not so, that is so wrong. It's so wrong. It's just how you do it. How you do it. What level are you in and what level will you go to? And can you stop before you get to that point of being in sin? There's my conclusion for you. Mardi Gras, by its very definition, is revelry. Reveling does not appeal to a Christian field with the Spirit of God. Those with God's perspective, perspective see reveling as foolish, immature, and not at all enjoyable. The wise know that many mistakes with lifelong consequences are made during seasons of reveling, whereas pleasant, 
God-honoring memories are made during seasons of godly joy. Reveling belongs to the world's system. Joyful satisfaction belongs to those in God's kingdom. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Let me share this with you. But the Holy Spirit, here's, here's the thing right here. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. The Holy Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. And everything I just gave to you is the Spirit of the Lord. It's His virtues. Reveling may have been an expression of an older, old nature before coming to Christ. As I told you, I was the very one out there, even had my children out there. I regret it to this day. But we went out there, and I did these same things. I didn't get into the party side of it as much. I didn't drink and all that, but I had my kids out on the street. Throw me something, mister. Throw me something. What, you going to get a plastic bee? <laughs> Hallelujah. It may have been an expression of my old nature, but it should never be part of our new life in him, in Christ. Galatians 5, 24 and 25. Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, which we should be, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Stand with me, please. If you got anything out of this message today, I think and I pray that you are not that you are not walking in the world's ways, but that you are or that you've heard that you can start spiritually walking in Christ. Let us pray this prayer. If you want to pray this prayer with me, I ask you to pray it and if not, then I ask you to speak to the Lord yourself. Hallelujah and just talk with him. Father in Jesus name, Lord, we just come before your throne, and as this word has come out, Lord God, I ask you to let it penetrate the hearts and the minds of your children. Father, to understand about you and who you are, and to come out of the world's ways. Lord, I ask you to just speak to their hearts now in Jesus' name. Father, I just thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you did on the cross that day. Thank you, Jesus, that the blood you shed was enough and that nothing else is needed in our lives but you. We give you praise, honor, and glory for what you did that day on the cross. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to forgive us, Lord God, for the things that we have done in our life that are not of you and that are wrong. Lord God, I thank you that as I turn my life away from those things and turn it to you, that you, Lord, will take a hold of me. Take, take hold of us change our ways to you lord that your spirit according to galatians 5 22 and 23 will abide in us that we may abide in you in jesus name raise your hands for the blessing please may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you may the lord lift up his countenance to, to you and give you peace you may go in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.